happy to present our January speaker, Don Moldy. Um, Don is a 50-year Reno resident, a retired physician, and a longtime wildlife advocate. He's a longtime member of LAS. He's right now the chair of the Conservation Committee. Uh, he's a former board member of the Nevada Humane Society and Defenders of Wildlife, and a current board member of the Mountain Lion Foundation. And he's also the current or the co-founder of Nevada Wildlife Alliance. So Don, take it away. All right, let's see if we can uh, get this to work. I think we're going to do it. Yeah, there we go. And let's put the, okay. <clears throat> so <clears throat> uh, thank you all for coming. <clears throat> um, I guess it's a little easier this way than driving through the snow, but uh, <clears throat> we're happy to be here in any event. Uh, <clears throat> wildlife management is a large topic, as I'm sure all of you know. Um, we're not going to come anywhere close to taking a comprehensive look at it uh, tonight. We're going to basically cherry pick some things that uh, have my interest uh, <clears throat> and things that are interesting to people who work on my side of the aisle. Uh, wildlife management, by and large, day-to-day, -day, um, you know, garden variety wildlife management is done by the states, not by the federal government. The feds have a role, like Endangered Species Act, Marine Mammal Protection Act, <clears throat> Migratory Bird Act, and so on. But basically, all the critters you have around your house that come through your yard and we see up uh, in the hills, uh, those animals belong to and man are managed by the state. So we're going to mostly talk about uh, Nevada and what goes on here. <clears throat> but uh, since a lot of uh, presentations often start with a story, I'll tell you my story as to how I got into it, and it involved a mountain lion. That's why I'm starting with a photo of a mountain lion. Uh, in about uh, mid-70s, probably 1975 or so, um, there was a photograph in the Reno paper that showed a, a guy standing in front of his car with a, with a rifle uh, 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 and a dead mountain lion <clears throat> draped over the hood of his car sideways as the sportsmen loved to do it. The caption under the photograph was that <clears throat> this was one of only 39 mountain lions left in the state of Nevada. I, 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 uh, and of course, that caught my attention, as I would hope it would anyone's. Uh, this was startling uh, that this would uh, be the case. So I checked around, found out there was an organization called the Nevada Department of Fish and Game. I, I, it, it, I believe it was that name in those days. It's since changed. But I found out where they were when they had a meeting and went to uh, what I think was a Wildlife Commission meeting. And I showed up at the um, agency and walked into a back conference room. There were 12 or 15 people sitting in a room <clears throat> having a meeting. And they looked at me and uh, I looked at them and they sort of said, who are you and why are you here? And I uh, unfolded a copy of the, <clears throat> of the photograph from the newspaper and said, I'm here because I, I, this offends me and I need to find out more information about it. So I was immediately uh, reassured by the person running the meeting uh, who said, oh yeah, yeah, we saw that, they got it wrong. <clears throat> there are actually 750 mountain lions in the state of Nevada. And so <clears throat> momentarily that seemed reassuring, but then I said, well, how do you know? And the answer, Verbatim, this is actually a quote, a mountain lion hunter told us. That, that's what they said to me. And at that point, um, alarm bells sort of went off in my head. And I think this, this sounds unreasonable, the fox in charge of the hen house. A mountain lion hunter decides how many mountain lions there are to be killed in this state. Or, uh, so then I asked how the mountain lion hunter knew uh, that, that number. And this is literally true. This is in 1975. Uh, the guy that was talking to me, he said, well, we had, he said, the mountain lion hunter lives down in Gardnerville. He's got some dogs and he runs lions along the Sierra front. So he knows about 30 mountain lions uh, locally here. And then we gave him a set of topog maps for the whole state of Nevada. 
we had him sit down, look through the topog maps, put an X where he thought the contours and the terrain would be suitable for a mountain lion to live. Oh. And at the end of it, he counted up the X's and added his 30 lions that he knew personally here and came up with 750 mountain lions. That, that is a true story. And at that point, I decided, well, somebody needs to do something <laughs> uh, to keep an eye on this agency. And so I don't know why it's me, but it is. So that got me started. And it took me about 15 years to fully understand uh, what this whole thing was about. And if I can remember to tell you that other story when I get to it, that will be my second and last story of the evening. So let's, uh, let's move on. Um, the first thing to understand <clears throat> is that um, uh, there is something called the public trust doctrine, which in this country goes back to the 1800s and in Britain and Europe, it goes back to centuries. And the idea is that there are certain public um, resources, natural cultural resources that sort of belong to everybody if you will, uh, things like navigable waters, wildlife, or land issues. And uh, so wildlife, it, it belongs under the public trust doctrine. And Nevada has a little peewee um, public trust doctrine statute, uh, NRS 501.100, basically says that wildlife in this state not domesticated in its natural habitat is part of the natural resources belonging to the people of the state of Nevada. So you notice here that wildlife does not belong to sportsmen. It does not belong to the Department of Wildlife. <clears throat> wildlife belongs to everybody who lives, and actually wildlife doesn't belong to anybody. It's one of our heritage, it's one of our resources that, that we can uh, appreciate. And then uh, NRS 501-100 uh, uh, continues by saying the preservation, protection, management, and so on contributes immensely, uh, immeasurably to the aesthetic, recreational, and economic uh, aspects of these natural resources. So we're in luck. Wildlife belongs to everybody. Now, uh, <clears throat> let me, um, what, what is going on here? Oh, I think I did something wrong. There we go. Okay, so some fun facts, I have to, what I'm doing is I have to move my little, uh, I won't do it here, I was trying to move this uh, uh, little picture I have of myself off the screen, but I, all right, so there are some fun facts, you can see them here before we get going. Nevada is 11th in biodiversity, fifth in the number of species extinctions, I think that's what it says. 450 species of birds have actually been recorded in Nevada, which for us birders is remarkable given that there are only something like 900 species on the uh, North American continent. So given our uh, arid terrain and uh, sparse habitat in many ways, almost one out of every two birds has been, uh, that exists in the North American continent has been seen here. There are 46 unique fish species, 61 species of mammals, some scorpions by the dozen, uh, 52 species of reptiles, the desert tortoise lives here, and we do have some endangered and threatened species, 28 animal and 10 plant. Uh, so Nevada is remarkably diverse, uh, given what you might expect when you drive across I-80. Uh, now, one thing that's, uh, we're going to look at some public attitudes to get started. And it's clear to me after 45 years or so of this that the public attitudes have changed dramatically over the last, uh, over that time period. Uh, I think there's a cultural shift in terms of appreciating wildlife and also with digital photography and the internet and so on, um, uh, information spreads much quicker about uh, wildlife and I think that generates an interest. So let's take a look first of all at a wildlife um, values report that came out a couple of three years ago. There was a national wildlife values survey, as you can see, and then each state had the option of uh, coughing up some money and getting some state specific uh, questions answered as well. The Nevada Department of Wildlife did that. And this is the report, <clears throat> uh, the, at least the, fr the front page of it. Now, one thing is interesting. There were about 1,200, uh, 1,400 respondents from Nevada in this survey. And the survey um, folks um, 
categorize the respondents into four, uh, into four groupings. The traditionalists, the red here, are the people that we used to think of and still do, I guess, as rural people like ranchers and so on who regard animals as kind of a property and something that uh, we manage and, um, and use in various ways. Uh, <clears throat> and sportsmen are generally in this category as well, that animals, uh, while we may appreciate them, we hunt them and use them in certain ways. Mutualists, which is me and many, most of the people I know, are this group in the green. And mutualists sort of believe that, you know, we all live on the same planet and we all ought to get along and that animals shouldn't be exploited. Uh, <clears throat> the pluralists um, are uh, people who have a foot on each side of the line. I'm not sure exactly uh, how they do that, although I can tell you that in a public meeting, Tony Wasley, who's our director of uh, our Department of Wildlife, uh, declared himself a pluralist. So at least I know one. Tony likes to feed birds and do photography, but he also hunts deer. So that makes him, in his view, a pluralist. And then there are the 15% uh, that we've always had and always known about who just don't care. Uh, wildlife and nature just has no interest to in them. So that's the way uh, Nevada citizens are breaking out as of a year or two ago with the pluralists outnumbering the traditionalists by two to one. And then, I mean, the mutualists and then the pluralists added on a bit here. It's kind of interesting. And from that same survey, uh, there was uh, some information about the anthropomorphism issue that came out of the survey. And this is anthropomorphism, as I'm sure you know, is the idea of uh, attributing human characteristics to animals. And for a long time, science has been resistant to that, thinking that there was something bad about it or that it was not proper to do that, although any of us who've had a dog or a pony or a cat or anything knows clearly that animals <laughs> certainly have human characteristics. And, and here it was some of the findings from that same survey I just mentioned that, uh, and here are the non-mutualists over here, and here are the mutualists in the darker color. Uh, the mutualists to the tune of 42% think that animals have free will. 47% of the mutualists think they have intentions, consciousness, 53%, minds of their own, 61%, emotional experiences, 62% of the mutualists, notice the non-mutualists are pretty much stuck at the same level. Uh, and the reason that this is kind of interesting to me is because the meaning of this, as we'll maybe get to later, is that fishing game agencies, Traditionally, the traditionalists are worried that the new public interest as demonstrated in this kind of a survey is going to force them to spend more time considering the fate of individual animals rather than populations of animals, which has been the gold standard for uh, forever. That is, as long as we have enough population to hunt and so on, we're in good shape. But the public is now wondering if individual animals shouldn't deserve some attention. So um, a new challenge for the fish and game people. Um, now, this is the map showing the anthropomorphic uh, thing. Here's California, which is the high, most highly anthropomorphic. And I think Vermont is up here as well. Here's Nevada, interestingly, which is sort of in the middle. Uh, we're not quite California, but we're a little more than Montana and Idaho. And here's my old stopping ground where I was born, North Dakota. Uh, I think in South Dakota, they're going and Wyoming, they're pretty much going to stay on the other end of the uh, anthropomorphic scale. Um, now, uh, here's a um, an attitude survey that was actually conducted by and paid for. Well, it was paid for and requested by the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. Each state's fish and game agency belongs to this organization. So this is the national grouping of fish and game agencies. And this survey was done by their uh, official polling organization, this responsive management group. That's a polling group, and they um, uh, they work together. These two uh, agent, uh, these two organizations. So let's take a look at some attitudes. First of all, if um, <clears throat> if you if you just ask a person who's naive about wildlife issues, whether they favor hunting. Um, and if the question is termed, uh, does the um, 
does the person agree with legal or regulated hunting? Here, note, note the word legal here. Generally speaking, most people will agree, I guess, presuming that, you know, well, if it's regulated, it's legal. Uh, who am I to, you know, second guess that? Uh, uh, so this is approximately correct. Four out of five Americans approve of legal hunting uh, on the face of it. But if you decide to look a little further, do you approve or disapprove of legal hunting? And here you can, the dark is strongly approved. So here you can clearly see that 55% and then moderately approved, that's where they get the 80%. Uh, and then uh, we get less uh, strong approval, of, uh, strong disapproval registers only 10% or so. So if you term it as legal hunting, that's what you get. But what if you ask about <clears throat> the uh, sort of the purposes or reasons for hunting? And you get strong approval to protect humans from harm, for meat, wildlife management, locally sourced foods, blah, blah, protect property. But look at what happens when you get down to ask about hunting for the sport of it. Only 26% strongly approved. For the challenge, 19%. For a trophy, and much of this goes on in Nevada, trophy hunting, 9% of the public approves strongly of trophy hunting. So it's not true in a sense that all public approves 80% of all hunting. It's certainly not the case. And if you uh, look at the species and ask about approval of hunting for various species, you can see duck, turkey, deer, this sort of thing. Look at what happens when you get down though to black bears, 39% approval, Count, uh, mountain lions, 37, wolves, 34, Grizzly bears, only one out of three approve of hunting grizzly bears. And when you get down with the African lion and the elephant, less than you know 10% or less. So it's clear that the public has rather dramatic um, views, well, differing views of hunting, depending on what you're asking about specifically. Um, and, and finally, uh, this one surprised me. 60% uh, of public appears to approve of hunting with a bow and an arrow which uh, as many, some of you may know is terribly uh, inefficient as a hunting device and many animals are injured and never caught when shot with bows and arrows. Hunting with dogs, 26%. Uh, and we have a local issue with hounding of bears that uh, is currently before the Wildlife Commission. So only one out of four approves of the use of dogs. Uh, using attractants, hunting over bait, hunting bears in the spring using high tech devices. Only 9% of the public approve, yet this is what hunting these days is mostly all about. ATVs and laser sights and all kinds of stuff. GPS collars on the dogs, it goes on and on. And uh, I don't know what this is, hunting on property that has a high fence around it. I guess that's game farms and the public doesn't like that either. So now let's get to uh, another thing that got me started way back years ago was trapping and the uh, damage that trappers do to uh, non-target species and whatnot. Now, this is kind of interesting because with respect to trapping, the, if you ask the question, do you approve or disapprove of regulated, or we could use the term legal trapping. Interestingly, only 29% of the public approves strongly of trapping. And the moderately approved rate is 23. So they combine those two to try to get to 50%, which you know the numbers show that. But look at that, <clears throat> moderately disapproved 10%, strongly disapproved 21%, don't know, 5%. So trapping has a little bit of a different look to it just in terms of that first general question. Now, if you break trapping down a little bit, do you approve of trapping as part of a restoration program? whatever that is. We don't do that in Nevada uh, for subsistence. Nobody traps in Nevada for subsistence to control wildlife populations. Nobody traps for wildlife control in this state for food. Nobody traps for food in Nevada for you know protection of crops, 39%, blah, blah. And here's where the Nevada trappers operate, the fur trappers in Nevada, right down here. To make money, 16% of the public approves. For fur clothing, 13%. For recreation, only 10% of the public of, of the public approves for uh, of trapping. So, uh, 
<clears throat> Let's move on to some utilization data before we get into some nuts and bolts here. Uh, this information comes from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the U.S. Census Bureau. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, here are the number of people who hunted and fished in Nevada, 2001, 2006, 2011. The light green are the anglers or the fishermen. They always outnumber hunters, by the way. And the dark green are the hunters. So you see these numbers during these three years. Here are the wildlife watchers in Nevada during the same time frame. Uh, the light green is around home, the dark green is away, away from home. And here, is, uh, here are, the, are the economic uh, considerations that go along with that, where we have the light green hunters, the darker green anglers, and the uh, wildlife watchers. And as you can see, uh, there's a, a rather dramatic uh, increase in not only wildlife watchers, number of participants, but in the economic uh, impact that it has on Nevada. Uh, now, we don't have any uh, state-specific data since 2011 due to political considerations, but here is some national data from 2016. If you look at uh, sportsmen, hunters, and anglers, uh, you get a total of about 40 million. Uh, some of the hunters and anglers did both. So that's how the numbers, I guess, gets there. Um, and there are expenditures they've calculated on a national basis of 81 billion. Take a look at wildlife watchers, 86 million wildlife watchers as compared to 40 fishermen and hunters. And by the way, this 86 million wildlife watchers does not include hunters who did not have a tag and went along with their friends on a hunt and count themselves as a wild. This number does not reflect that. So, um, and the expenditures are roughly the same nationally. I don't know what state specific numbers are yet, but we'll probably get them. So it's pretty clear that there's a tremendous uh, uh, surge of interest over the last two decades, really over the last decade probably, in terms of wildlife watching and the economic impact of that as compared to uh, the traditional uh, consumptive activities, fishing and hunting. Now, um, this is a uh, pie chart that was presented to the Nevada legislature, uh, I think in 2014 by the Department of Wildlife. And I simply show it to give you a little visual indication of the relative impact of wild watching a wildlife watching uh, versus hunting and fishing. And then boating is a big deal in Nevada, in Nevada as well. But wildlife watching, even in 2014, according to uh, the department's own data, is double uh, combined hunting and fishing. So we're on the, we're on the, <clears throat> on the upswing, uh, uh, no question about it. Now here is the uh, homepage of the uh, Nevada Department of Wildlife. I just made a screenshot of it. And I would encourage everybody to uh, go and have a look and, and explore it at your will. Um, the, uh, the Department uh, of Wildlife is, is the state agency. It's like the Highway Department, the Welfare Department, the, uh, you know, all the departments that the state has. Uh, this is also a state agency with state employees, which number somewhere in the neighborhood of 260. Uh, the annual budget of the Department of Wildlife is somewhere north of 50 million. And these are um, like all state employees, they have requirements to get the job, they have training, credentials, and so on. And uh, the department does have offices uh, around the state. Now, uh, here's where there's a bit of a rub from my point of view. The, uh, we also have something called the Nevada Board of Wildlife Commissioners. And this is not, these are not state employees. Uh, these are political appointees uh, by the governor. Uh, and uh, per uh, Nevada statute, the way the law is currently written, out of the nine wildlife commissioners that we have, five must be sportsmen by law, one a farmer, one a rancher, and by the way, these two traditionally for the last 45 years that I've been going there have always been sportsmen as well, or sportsmen sympathizers. Uh, there's one conservationist um, and 
one general public. And up till 10 years ago, this general public member was also a sportsman whenever I would go over there. So currently, essentially of the nine commissioners that we have, seven are sportsmen. One a conservationist, one a general public member, despite the user numbers I just showed you. Um, the uh, interesting thing about the commissioners is that the only qualification to be on the Wildlife Commission, uh, if you're a sportsman, is that you need to have a hunting or a fishing license three of the last four years. And for the other two, there are no requirements. So none of the nine commissioners, sportsmen or, or uh, conservation or whatnot, nobody has to know anything about science or have a biology degree or understand research design or data or any of that stuff. There are uh, literally anybody in the state uh, could be appointed to the Wildlife Commission. Of course, that's silly because the governor is going to hopefully pick people that he thinks or she thinks will be okay. But this is a total different body from what I told you about with the department, not state employees, political appointees. And they sit essentially on top of the agency and have veto power over a lot of the stuff that interests me as we'll get to uh, shortly. Um, now, uh, I have great respect for the Department of Wildlife. That is the state employees and the department. They do uh, some terrific things. Um, uh, and also once in a while, the commission does something good too. For example, in 2017, the Wildlife Commission, uh, prompted by a terrific amount of staff work, uh, banned the commercial collection of reptiles. Uh, it had gone on, we were, it was embarrassing. Uh, we had been, were the only state in the West that allowed commercial reptile collection to the tune of 15 or 20,000 reptiles a year, collected, shipped overseas and so on. Most of them died before they got where they were going. It was terrible. Uh, but uh, the uh, department itself, uh, I think, is, is, is just terrific. Uh, the director's office, uh, currently uh, uh, Tony Wasley is the director uh, of the agency. Um, he inter he's part of the governor's team. He uh, is a secretary for the Wildlife Commission when they have their meetings. He interacts with the, he does all kinds of things. Tony is a very busy guy. And I, I think highly of Tony. Uh, I, think, I think we have a good one with him. The, the department also has the game division. This is sort of the biggie. This is where all the hunting stuff goes on, the duck hunting and the elk hunting and the deer hunting and so on. That's the, the game division is the big, uh, sort of the tail that wags the dog uh, to some extent in, in the terms of the uh, wildlife department. We have the conservation education department or division. There's a lot of education that goes on. And some of you have probably seen some of the Zoom meetings or webinars that Endow has put on for getting along with urban wildlife and, and uh, birds and so on. They, I think they do a good, a terrific job. The wildlife diversity or biodiversity program worries about butterflies and bats and all kinds of things that nobody ever hears about, but they, they worry about them and they work on them. There's a habitat division which uh, worries about land use. So if a mine is gonna expand or uh, some land use plan is proposed that might affect wildlife, uh, Endow has its habitat people uh, take a look at it and uh, uh, write uh, responses for EISs and all that sort of stuff. Fisheries, fairly big, particularly in the South with Lake Mead, uh, very active. We have fisheries around the state. There's a big data uh, tech system uh, division. There's a lot of numbers to keep track of, let me tell you in the department. And then my, one of my favorites, law enforcement. Law enforcement, game wardens, I think are sort of the nonpartisan uh, part of the department. Uh, I love what they do. They're good at their job. It's a tough job. And when I do make my periodic donations to the Department of Wildlife, I ask that the money go to law enforcement. Um, now, uh, let me talk about uh, money. <laughs> Um, and the reason we're going to get into this a little bit is because over the years, when I've gone to the commission meetings with my friends and we've taken our issues there, uh, generally knowing we were outvoted seven to two before we even got there, uh, we would nonetheless go and uh, make a fuss and so on. And sportsmen would often tell us, well, why are you here? We pay for wildlife. We're the ones that pay for wildlife. You don't pay for wildlife. So therefore, 
by implication, <laughs> why are you here? You know, we should have the say uh, and so on. So I thought we'd take a little a peek at uh, whether that's true or not. And in fact, what sportsmen do pay just for fun, of course, uh, that's a bit of a joke. Anyway, back in the old days, uh, when it, it was decided that wildlife management needed to be uh, implemented, that uh, that uh, the game, um, you know, the, the people that went out and killed all kinds of game for commercial purposes and so on were making too many inroads in populations, um, it got decided that we should have a wildlife management system. And originally it was set up um, on a user fee basis. So the legislator said, okay, we need a wildlife department, but let's not put any of our own money in it from the state budget. Let's make the hunters and the fishermen and the trappers who are using the game, let's make them pay for it. So uh, the, the user fee concept came into being and therefore the state legislators had a program but they didn't have to pay for it. And they, it was kind of a win-win uh, at that time, or so it seemed to them. But over the years, this has become problematic because hunting isn't what it used to be. Uh, the number of hunters is dropping off uh, every year. Uh, wildlife agencies do not have proper funding. And so the user fee uh, idea back when it was a good idea is no longer a good idea. And I'll show you a little bit why. But first of all, and while we're at it, um, uh, the fish and game people are so worried about this that five years ago, they set up a committee to look into the matter, how to get more money. And it turns out that Tony Wasley, our uh, local director right here, was co-chairman of that committee. Uh, and they basically tried to lay out a roadmap for fish and game agencies to expand their uh, view of things. And basically what it comes down to is increasing agency engagement and service to broader constituents. So the way to the future is not to sell more hunting licenses. The way to the future is to get more people like us or like me and others to engage with the department and to come up with some money somehow. So this is a really big deal. And I'm very proud that Tony was part of this. Uh, now, let me show you this. Um, uh, I'm going to have to uh, do something here. Okay. Th this is a... Uh, um, a document that was provided to the Nevada legislature in 2014. I show it not because of the numbers, forget all the numbers, but they don't use this form anymore. And what I wanted to show you are two things. This is the revenue for projection for that year. And there's a thing here that says sportsman's revenue. And if you go across to here, you see that it's a 30% it's a 30 item. And then if we go up here to wildlife restoration and sport fisher restoration, and we come across here, here are two numbers that add up to about 30%. Now these two items are uh, federal excise taxes on fishing gear and on ammunition and archery equipment and guns. And those two sources of federal excise taxes come to state fish and game agencies based upon a certain formula uh, that helps them fund their program. So I'm just showing you this to help us a little further on that the uh, sportsman, the way Endow reported this, accounts for about 30% of the budget and the federal excise tax is another 30%. The rest of it we can get into later. Uh, so now uh, I need to uh, uh, move on. Okay, so now just some numbers. How many hunters in Nevada? Well, just resident hunting licenses, somewhere in the ballpark of 60,000. Now, if you keep in mind that uh, the Nevada population is about 3 million plus, you can see that the number of resident hunting uh, licenses is about 2% of the state's population. How many fur trappers? Well, there's about 1,000. Uh, how many fishermen? Well, 80,000 or so. There are uh, non-resident hunting and fishing uh, uh, people that show up, but they're small in numbers. And I'm going to essentially uh, not look at their numbers specifically because they're quite small, but uh, we'll put a fudge factor into account for them. Now, okay, so what do guys pay? Suppose you want a fishing license in Nevada and you're an adult, a resident, 40 bucks. Well, you're a fishing license. You want a hunting license, but just a regular hunting license, 38 bucks. If you want a hunting license, um, 
with a fishing license associated with it, 75 bucks. Um, now the fur, um, uh, the um, trapping license, 40 bucks. And they have some other fees here, which we won't look at, uh, guides license and so on, one day fees. Uh, so these are the, that's what the residents pay uh, for that. Now, if you are a deer hunter, uh, in Nevada, if you buy a hunting license, that doesn't get you <laughs> a chance to kill a deer. You also have to come up with a tag. So you have to submit your name and an application uh, <clears throat> to uh, and see if you're lucky enough to get a tag. And if you do get a tag, you pay an extra 30 bucks. So basically you can hunt a deer in Nevada for 70 bucks, 40 bucks for a regular hunting license, 30 bucks for a deer tag, and you're in business. Uh, antelope tags, a little bit higher, 60. Elk tags, 120, bighorn sheep. Now you can see down here that the uh, they soak the out-of-state guys uh, pretty good, but there aren't very many of them that actually uh, uh, come here. We have to have some out-of-staters in Nevada because of all the public lands. And there have been lawsuits uh, confirming uh, that uh, requirement, um, sometimes to the discontent of the local guys. But um, now, so keep in mind that the, uh, the, the, the budget number we're looking, we're thinking about here uh, is 50 million. So with that in mind, let's take a look at hunting licenses. So 60,000 hunting licenses times now this 60 bucks is a made up number. I don't have data telling me how many hunting and fishing licenses were sold as compared to regular hunting licenses. So I'm just kind of coming up with a generous uh, guesstimate, uh, uh, combining the two at 60 bucks. And uh, that coughs, that gives us about 3.6 million. Now, about 3.6 million. Now, uh, if we throw in the fishing licenses, 80,000 for 40 bucks, uh, we get about 3.2. And if we throw in the trapping licenses, which are nothing, 40 grand is all that amounts to. With the license sales, uh, we can come up with, uh, what should, well, let's just round it off to what, maybe 7 million out of 50 million, which is the nut that has to be cracked. So now let's look at the tag revenue. So uh, mule deer tags, a year or two ago, there were 18,000 mule deer tags that were issued at resident tags at 30 bucks a tag. So that brings us 540, uh, whoops, there's a miss, I'm missing a zero here, but uh, 540,000. Elk tags, uh, 7,500 issued, 120 bucks, 900,000. Uh, pronghorns, 4,000 tags issued at 60 bucks, 240,000. Bighorn tags, 330 bighorn tags at 120. So we get another 40,000. And then here's a, a little sneaky source of revenue, the tag application fee. So there are about 250,000 tag applications submitted by somewhere around 70,000 people. And if you uh, add 10 bucks per each tag application, I think that's the way it works. You come up with another two and a half million. So they make more on the on the application fee than they do on all of the tag sales. But let's say we add all this together. So let's say we've got a 900, let's say we got a couple million here and another two and a half there. So we got four and a half plus seven. So now we're up to about 11 and a half million out of the $50 million budget. But let's throw the out of staters in and uh, let's round it off to 15 million, let's say. And so now we're 15 million out of 50 million, so about 30% or so. Now, here's something of interest. Um, my name is on here, but Mark Smith did all the work. Uh, this was a paper that Mark put together five years ago that's never been rebutted. No, it's been around the country. Lots of people looked at, academics have looked at it. Nobody has challenged it in any uh, decent way. And what Mark, what we're talking about is who really pays for wildlife in the US. Now this is national data. We didn't have the capability to look at state specific data. So this is what, uh, we, what Mark came up with nationally. Now, one of the things Mark did is that he, uh, looked at uh, land uh, management, looked at the uh, 
uh, refuge system, the BLM, the Forest Service National Park, looked at state lands, which you could get data for Nature Conservancy Land Trust. And he looked to see how much land was purchased by hunters, how much land was purchased by non-hunters. And although I can't see the bottom of, uh, of my screen because of my, uh, uh, my uh, Zoom pictures here, I think you'll see that about 5% or 4% of the land uh, by these agencies, purchased by these agencies, was actually purchased with hunting money as 95% 95, 95 uh, from the general public. And here's the one that Mark was extremely clever about. He, uh, Mark is an, uh, a former hunter. Uh, he's a firearms dealer. Uh, he knows, um, he spends a lot of time at the shooting range. He's, he's an expert on firearms. And there's a lot of national data on firearms. And so Mark went through the uh, data, had a look at it and estimated what would be uh, ammunition and uh, the types of firearms and so on that would be used in hunting and what would not. For example, a 50 caliber sniper rifle is not used for hunting, nor is a 22 uh, handgun. So uh, Mark went through all of this, looked at all the numbers and then devised a percentage derived from hunting activities uh, and found that the Pittman-Robertson monies, which is the federal excise tax money, uh, uh, accounts for about 15% from hunters and about 85% uh, from non-hunters. People like me that used to go out and shoot tin cans and things like that. So the hunters like to claim that they are the source of all of the Pittman-Robertson monies that come in, but they are not. They are far, far short of that. So uh, if you wanted to um, figure out what contribution hunters make to Endow's budget, uh, throwing in their license tag fees and uh, out of staters and a little bit from Pittman Robertson, you know, I'd, I'd maybe give them, I don't know, 35%, maybe 40 at the most. Now, uh, let's talk ungulates because this is the big deal. When you think of a wildlife department, everybody thinks of deer hunters and so on. Uh, and the bighorn sheep, of course, is the iconic animal in Nevada for, for a couple of reasons. One is we have them more uh, bighorns than um, any other state except Alaska. And for the second reason is that the bighorns were one of two ungulates that were in this state 150 years ago when the explorers came here. Uh, bighorns and pronghorns or antelope. There were no deer and no uh, elk in Nevada to speak of, probably no sustainable populations of either. Um, and so the bighorn is an historic native animal. It's been here forever uh, and was, a, uh, and, uh, and hopefully will stay. Now, just for fun, uh, these are uh, Nevada elk, pronghorn and bighorn numbers from 1985 to 2019. Now the blue are pronghorns. So you can see here the pronghorn numbers, pronghorns have done extremely well. In Nevada, and they're almost up to 30,000 animals. Um, the red are elk, and as you can see, elk were introduced into Nevada. Uh, and here are the elk numbers uh, over the years. And at this point, uh, people were complaining about elk. The ranchers were complaining about the elk uh, raiding their haystacks and whatnot. And the department made some effort to reduce the number of elk. Or putting it another way, elk are proliferative around the West. If Nevada called up Montana and said, would you take 5,000 of our elk? Montana would say, no, we, we've got enough elk of our own. So uh, we've got a lot of elk, got a lot of pronghorns. Now this little gray line are a bighorn sheep. And as you can see, bighorns have increased to the point where now we have about 12,000 bighorns, but they have a different uh, they have a different uh, trend than uh, these two. And bighorns are kind of a special case. They're a very sensitive animal biologically and would be worth a whole discussion sometime on their own. I wouldn't be the person to do that, but uh, it would be interesting. Now, uh, let me show you deer numbers. Um, these are deer numbers from 1985 to 2019. And keep in mind that there were no deer here 150 years ago. So deer, in a sense, are an introduced animal to Nevada as well. And uh, here is 1985. You notice this spike goes up a little short of 250,000 
number of animals. And then since then, we're down here to about in the low 90s, low 90,000. And that's the number, that's the number of mule deer estimated to be in the state uh, presently. And this is a whole story that we'll roughly touch on here and sh shortly if I can uh, get to it. So we'll come back to deer in a, in a little bit. Uh, sage grouse, um, one of my interests, everybody knows sage grouse, it's in the news all the time. Um, we have a hunting season on sage grouse in Nevada, even all the publicity, even all the, you've seen all the publicity here are sage grouse kills by hunters from 1970 to 2015. And you notice back in the seventies and eighties, uh, at some point they were up to almost uh, 27, 28,000 sage grouse killed a year uh, in Nevada. There was no data for this year, but you can see the trend. Sage grouse have taken a real hit in terms of the number that hunters have killed down to uh, around 12 or 1500 now. Um, and one of the things that uh, happens with sage grouse is that uh, the hunters voluntarily submit a wing from the grouse that killed and biologists can tell a lot from the wing of a dead sage grouse, including whether uh, the females nested and whether they were successful. Now here is some um, uh, nesting data, if you will, from 2006 to 2018. And the yellow line is the lambda line, which is keeping, this is where things would stay even if the production uh, hit one and a half chicks per, per hen. Here's the actual production of chicks calculated during that time. And as you can see, there's more of it below the line than above the line. And this is where it is currently. So sage grouse uh, production is not looking good either. So question is that I continue to ask them, why are you still hunting sage grouse? It doesn't make an ounce of sense. And what they say is, well, it gives necessary biological information. Although we now know with all these modern techniques, you don't have to kill an animal to know something about it. They claim that hunting is compensatory. And this is a concept that's very interesting because all hunting, uh, hunters are told that all hunting is compensatory. And briefly, what that means is if you kill an animal, it leaves things a little bit better for all the other animals still alive and left behind. Therefore, you are helping the species by killing the thing you did. On the other hand, uh, if a mountain lion kills a deer, that's disaster because then the deer uh, numbers are diminished. So, and that's called additive uh, uh, mortality. So that, so hunters believe they're doing the animal a favor by killing it. I'm kind of joking, but I'm actually not. This is what's told to them. Hunter opportunity, which I may get to or not in my story, is why they're doing it. If, we're, if we were to get rid of sage grouse hunting in this state, if the commission were to do that, they would be roundly criticized by the sportsmen for taking away hunter opportunity, which is the gold standard by which all of their actions are judged, whether it increases hunter opportunity or not. And they claim they don't kill very many. Well, there aren't that many to kill. So now I have a picture of a raven. Why would we do that? Well, uh, the raven in Nevada now is the new coyote, so to speak. We poison about 5,000 ravens a year. That's all we can poison, according to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Half of those are poisoned to protect sage grouse because it's known that ravens take eggs out of sage grouse nests. And some do, although uh, uh, one time I saw a threat list put out by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, all the threats sage grouse are facing and the raven was number 19 on the threat list. Uh, you know, leading the charge are things like fire and cheatgrass, invasive, invasive species, uh, ranching and livestock uh, mining expand, all kinds of things. Um, and the raven is not the only bird that knows how to catch a sage grouse chick. I mean, we got falcons and hawks and uh, magpies and grub. we got all kinds of stuff. So, but the raven is currently popular uh, as an animal to blame uh, for being a bad bird. And we now poison um, uh, 5,000, 2,500 of those come on a permit from the wildlife department. The other 2,500 are given to the wildlife services we'll get to in a minute so they can kill ravens around uh, garbage dumps and airports and things of that sort. Um, so let's move on quickly to fur trapping. Um, it still exists in Nevada. And this is, of course, the primary target of fur trappers, uh, the bobcat. And uh, they, um, 
unfortunately catch a lot of other things besides bobcats. Uh, this is over about 10 years, about one out of five trappers actually told the non-targets they catch, they catch rabbits, uh, rabbits by the thousands, dogs, cats, mountain lions, livestock, badgers, bears, bobcats, feral pigs, ground squirrels, pack rats, pond turtles, porcupines, and they don't uh, mess around with birds either. The trappers catch golden eagles. That's illegal as can be. Nobody complains about it. The department doesn't do anything about it. Hawks, owls, herons, geese, magpies, a lot of magpies get caught and so on. So um, these are animals that are incidentally caught by trappers. They're not intended to be caught, by big, but the nature of the trap allows for that. And if you just add all these animals up, as I did, over the, these guys, one out of five trappers over about 10 reporting years killed somewhere around 7,200 animals and birds um, or caught them and most of them die. Uh, and that was the reason why another, why Mark Smith and I sued them over this. And unfortunately we lost that suit recently. Mountain lions are incidentally caught, forget the numbers. Mountain lions uh, wind up missing toes. They have missing uh, broken teeth by chewing the trap and the chain that's got them. They have combinations of tooth, claw, leg, foot injuries. Sometimes um, they're caught accidentally and removed from traps. If you total up uh, all the injuries uh, um, animals with injuries and compare them to the number of lions killed each year by hunters. It looks like somewhere in the neighborhood of 15, 16, 18 percent of the lions brought in by hunters for inspection show evidence of trap injury every year. Didn't mean that they were killed by the traps or whatnot, but, but on the other hand, some are because this study was done by Allison Andreessen, a, a PhD student at UNR uh, for several years from 2009 or 10 up till 16 or thereabouts. She trapped about, uh, collared and uh, trapped and collared 50 lions or thereabouts around the Reno Carson City Sweetwaters range. And oops, I, uh, and she found that uh, this was not a purpose of her study. She was looking to see where they go and what they eat, but she found that a number of her subjects were caught by traps and snares sufficient that she became concerned about it, had one or two cases where they were killed uh, and uh, wrote this paper saying that mountain lions uh, look like they might have some trouble um, due to trappers and maybe the department should do something about it. Now the department, two of the biologists <laughs> during this time tried to claim that her findings were anomalous, that this was just something around Reno and trappers and that it didn't happen statewide. So we got um, all the mountain lion uh, reports uh, that were their inspection of, of the carcass occurs and notations are made about abnormalities. And we plotted a GIS plot of all the mountain lions during the same years that Allison Andreessen was conducting her uh, studies, all the, all, the, all the mountain lions that were brought to the department for inspection that showed trap injuries during those exact same years. And here is the scattergram showing that. In other words, what she was pointing out locally due to her study was occurring all over the state. And of course, we knew that. The department was trying to claim that it wasn't true. Um, now, let's talk a minute about mountain lions. Uh, Nevada doesn't have very many mountain lions. Uh, because of the terrain that we have, the mountain, uh, Great Basin, you know, the Basin Range thing and, and whatnot. The last uh, official uh, population estimate I can find that the department has done uh, was this one, which was presented to the Wildlife Commission in 2014. And the blue line is the estimate of the cougar population from 2008 to 2000. And you can see it's a little short of 1400. Um, the, um, they, um, and so, uh, and, this, oops, I just screwed up. This table um, shows the number of mountain lions that are killed. Uh, I have these years, uh, I guess I haven't updated this, but just take a look. The, numbers, uh, the number of mountain lions killed each year from hunting, which is the biggest source of mortality for that is sports hunters. And then uh, depredation, meaning wildlife services, a rancher calls, lost some sheep, they call the government trappers and they get killed. So mountain lion uh, mortality of those two sources, somewhere uh, rule of thumb, 200 mountain lions a year are killed in Nevada. Um, and uh, we'll leave this uh, other stuff uh, alone here. What we don't know here though, is how many lions die of starvation due to trap injuries that nobody 
Um, they don't they don't die in a trap. They're released or tear uh, toe off. They go off somewhere else and starve. Nobody finds them. We don't know that, but there are some of those. Um, now let me move on. I'm sort of going quickly because I noticed the time is uh, shrinking a little. I want to talk about predator control. Uh, I don't like the word predator. I think it should be banned from wildlife usage. Uh, these are just animals trying to make a living uh, the best way they can. And predator is a you know, derogatory term. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, um, the reason I have this here is because some sportsmen and some, if not most of the wildlife commissioners I've ever known have a fixed unalterable belief that predators depress deer numbers, that it's the fault of coyotes and mountain lions that we don't have 200,000 deer every year in Nevada, which is utter nonsense, but they believe that. And uh, unfortunately, um, and in a minute, we'll get to uh, 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 something else about it, but here, I, I want to mention wildlife services. This is a government agency. Uh, it's the Ag Department, the uh, APHIS Ag Department thing. It's a misnomer. Wildlife services is a government's predator killing program. Many of you may not have heard of it. It exists. It's a, a kind of a combination of federal, state, and private monies. Uh, and basically, they're the ones that ranchers call if they have trouble. Airports call them if there are too many birds around. Um, garbage dumps call wildlife services if they don't like all the gulls. Uh, and basically what Wildlife Services does a lot of is they kill things. And this came from, uh, this was a couple of years ago, uh, just a brief glimpse at what they've done. They, over a year, they killed 515,000 red-winged blackbirds, 68,000 coyotes, 22,500 beaver, 20,000 morning doves, 17,000 prairie dogs, 10,000 cormorants, cormorants are that bad bird that eat fish, 2,000 mallards, gray foxes, red-tailed hawks, bobcats, owls, wolves, black bears. That's what wildlife services does. And so what happens is that uh, in 2003, because of that deer uh, decline, uh, the, I showed you a, a, that graph a while ago about deer numbers in Nevada descending from uh, uh, 19, uh, from uh, 85 down to uh, the current levels. Sportsmen in the early 2000s uh, were really worried about those uh, declining numbers, as you can imagine. And in 2003, they got the legislature to pass a bill adding a $3 surcharge to all tag applications, which currently generates uh, north of uh, $500,000 a year to be spent on predator control in the belief that predators somehow control deer numbers. So every year, the Department of Wildlife, by law, has to spend five, six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars on predator control. Now they could spend it on research and habitat improvement and so on up until 2015, when Governor Gibbons, um, uh, uh, no, it was uh, uh, it wasn't Gibbons. Sandoval was there, and uh, the Republicans, when they had control of everything except the governor's office, well, they and he was a governor, so they had control of everything. So they passed a, uh, an amendment to a law saying that 80% of the um, predator fee money had to be spent on lethal projects, that is killing something, whether there was any showing of need or not. So what, what the commission does, since it has to do something, is it contracts with wildlife services, this government agency I just showed you, to do the killing. The department doesn't do its own killing, it doesn't get its hands dirty. And so since 2003, um, there have been 26 projects like go to the rubies, go to Granite Range, go, uh, go into the monitors and kill some critters. 26 projects have been contracted by the commission to wildlife services to kill uh, mountain lions or coyotes on behalf of deer. <clears throat> During that uh, time, uh, 205 mountain lions have been killed. Almost 11,000 coyotes have been killed in these 26 projects. And the commission has spent in the ballpark of $5 million to do the killing. And here's what Nevada's mule deer numbers have done. Here's 2000 and as you know, uh, this, the numbers have basically gone down to the low 90s. So with all of this carnage done to create deer numbers out of whole cloth, this is the result. Um, and yet, 
sportsmen believe that this is true. So um, this uh, graph was put together by the Department of Wildlife a few years ago in one of their reports. And this basically shows what happens with mountain lions. Um, the uh, uh, the uh, deer population, I think I can't see my screen, but I think this is the deer. When deer numbers go up, mountain lion numbers also go up, but with a lag, there's usually a year or two lag. And then when the deer numbers come down, mountain lion numbers also come down with a lag. And so it's the prey, the availability of prey animals, if we can use that term, that determines the population of predators. It's not the other way around, uh, <clears throat> despite what sportsmen believe in their unshakable belief. Now, it's not cheap to do this. Uh, I've done some quick calculations in the past. When the commission contracts with wildlife services to kill coyotes, it costs roughly $500 per coyote to kill one. Mountain lion costs from 2,500 bucks up to as high, I've seen as high as $50,000 spent to kill one mountain lion on these predator projects. Ravens are cheap to kill. They just put out poisoned eggs and cost about 22 bucks to kill a raven. Now, mule deer in the, mule deer is, the big, is a big issue in the West. But it's not just Nevada. That's what sportsmen don't understand. Here are the trend in the Western states from 1970 on the left to 2013 on the right. Now here's Nevada. This doesn't show quite as dramatic as some, but you can see the decline. Look in California, how mule deer numbers have fallen in California. Utah has fallen off, Arizona a bit, Oregon a little bit, Idaho, the same thing. So there's something about deer, mule deer, that are special uh, and that's a topic for another time. I just show you this to let you know that the, the deer issue in Nevada is not something unique and special to Nevada. It's something that's going around the West. And if you look at what Endow says about deer numbers uh, and why they're down, urbanization, sustainable use of rangelands, plant senescence, that turned out to be a big one in this state. Pinion, juniper, encroachment, invasive species, wildfire, they don't say anything about predators. This is the Endow website where you can find this. Now, a quick thing about the bears. <clears throat> this is, <laughs> this is a, a bear picture I took in Alaska many years ago. Uh, her name was Pest and she was a, a, a grizzly bear. I used to go visit in the summers uh, on Admiralty Island, but that's not the point. The point is our local bear, <clears throat> um, uh, bear hunt deal here. Um, as many of you know, this is very unpopular. The Nevada bear hunt came about in 2010. Uh, by a rogue wildlife commission that Governor Gibbons had appointed. Uh, we hadn't had a bear hunt in 85 years and they decided to do one. And the reason they did it is hunter opportunity. There's no other reason for a bear hunt. It's not for management. There's no population control. It's very unpopular with the public and they kill about 15 bears a year. Uh, and about 50 bears from all causes are killed every year, but the hunters kill about 15. And there's some uh, uh, interest in getting rid of the bear hunt, but legally they're not able to do it at this point for a reason I'll maybe get to later. The population, the you know, people don't like the bear hunt. 50% uh, <laughs> disagree. Only 20%, 30% agree with bear hunting and they don't like dogs at all. And this is a petition we have in front of the commission right now to ask them to stop using dogs. Uh, coyote killing contests. Uh, this is uh, where uh, guys go out on a weekend to a hotel, a register on a Friday night, pay a fee, uh, have a drink up, uh, you know, have a few adult beverages, go out Saturday, kill as many coyotes as they can, wherever they can, bring them back, dump them in a big pile, have their photographs taken, and then basically just um, dump the coyotes. Um, and there are prizes awarded for the one that kills the biggest one or the biggest female or whatever. Um, the commission, we petitioned the commission in 2015 to get rid of these things. Uh, they refused, um, mostly because they would be severely criticized by their constituent sportsmen for taking away opportunity. And as I mentioned before, that's what the whole thing is about, opportunity. It's not about wildlife and they love wildlife. It's about hunter opportunity. And, you know, they don't like coyotes, sportsmen don't. Anyway, um, I, I will tell you one other story and then we're done. This hunter opportunity thing, for years, I used to go to the Wildlife Commission 
uh, and uh, I would talk to them and I would speak in English and they would speak back to me in English. And I thought that, you know, that was the coin of the realm and that, but they didn't seem to understand me. I didn't seem to understand them. And it just, I would go home and turn on the vacuum cleaner and vacuum the crap out of the rug and just grind my wheels. And, and finally in 1992, uh, Nevada had been in a drought for five years. Uh, and in fact, in 92, Governor Miller declared a drought disaster uh, emergency uh, situation in five counties, including Churchill and Pershing counties, where there's a lot of duck hunting going on. And I used to go to the meeting for the trapping stuff and the waterfowl thing would be the agenda item just before it. And over the years, I kind of noticed there was some funny business with the waterfowl meeting. So I did a little checking and found out that um, the way it's supposed to work is that the um, US Fish and Wildlife Service surveys waterfowl populations in Canada and elsewhere. And then uh, it makes recommendations to individual states within the flyways, we're in the Pacific flyway here. And the Fish and Wildlife Service says, okay, you can have a duck hunting season from zero days, you don't have to have one if you don't want one state, up to 90 days. And you can kill uh, no pintails or up to five pintails, or uh, you know, no mallards up to seven mallards, whatever it is. The US Fish and Wildlife Service gives the states a range and then the states are supposed to look at their local conditions and then pick numbers within the range given them by the Fish and Wildlife Service that makes sense for that state. Well, I had noticed over the years that Nevada always, the department always recommended big numbers. And so I did a little checking. And sure enough, in 1992, the biologist uh, from the department got up, made the presentation to the commission about the status of ducks and geese and you know, swans and all that, and then made the department recommendations. And I knew when he was telling the commission that he was giving the commission the largest numbers that the uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service said Nevada could have, even though we were in a drought. So he gave the numbers and at the end of his presentation, he said, uh, and we think that this is a conservative recommendation. And so um, I was prepared for this. So I got up and I said, let me ask you a question. Uh, I just heard your biologist uh, give his report. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I believe that he gave you the biggest numbers that Nevada can have under the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service guidelines for season length and uh, bag limits. Is that not correct? And, you know, there was some, yeah, that's, that's right. And he also used the word conservative when he gave you these numbers. And if I recall correctly, Governor Miller just declared a drought disaster area in these, place, in these counties where you guys go duck hunting. So here's my question. If the biggest numbers are conservative, what in the hell could be radical? How could there be a radical if that's conservative? Uh, I mean, it, it made no sense in the English language to me. And so there's a silence in the room. And the Wildlife Commission chairman, who's a lawyer from Las Vegas, uh, it was clear he didn't want to answer the question. So he turned to Willie Molini, who was then the director. And Molini uh, sat back in his chair for a moment and put his hands behind his head and thought for a second or two. And then he said, okay. He said, it would be radical if the department and the commission took any action that deprived the sportsman of a legal opportunity to kill something, that's what would be radical. And at that point, a light bulb went off and I thought, holy Toledo, 15 years I've been coming here. I always thought this place was about wildlife, but it's not about wildlife. It's about hunter opportunity. And that's why I never understood what there was. Anyway, so that's my last story. And um, we'll pass by this one and um, do one more little uh, goodbye here. The end is new. I love that photograph. And we finally made it to the end. So um, with that, I'll stop talking and see uh, if there's any interest in questions or whatnot. Uh, yeah, so if anybody has any questions, you can go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, and then I'll just read them to Don. We do have one that was asked sort of near the beginning. Um, she, uh, Sally asked, how many mountain lions were there in 1975 uh, when you told the story from the beginning? 
Well, they claimed, uh, the, the department claimed there were 750. But as I mentioned, the only, the only way they came up with that number was to have a guy make a bunch of X's on a topog map. They didn't know. And they don't to this day. And they, the department currently is not making an estimate of lion populations. They stopped doing that a few years ago, uh, allegedly because it's hard to do and so on. But I think it was because we filed a lawsuit against them. And uh, the, uh, one of the issues in the lawsuit had to do with the number of mountain lions and what was happening. And, and so now there is no official estimate of the lion population. The only lion population uh, estimate is what I showed you in 2014. So in uh, 75, who knows? I don't know. They don't know. Okay. Um, uh, Sally also asked, uh, given all of the information from your presentation, what can we do uh, to help wildlife? Well, uh, that's also a very good question um, without a very good answer um, in, the, in this respect. Uh, if you're interested in wildlife and want to be a part of it, um, the Nevada Department of Wildlife and the Nevada Board of Wildlife Commissioners is where you need to go. There is no other place to interact uh, with the uh, governing agencies about wildlife uh, in the state. And so that means going to wildlife commission meetings and looking on their website, reading the minutes of their meetings, um, maybe sending in letters and so on. Um, uh, and, and so some of us do that, but um, I, in, in recent years, I've stopped recommending that the general public go to the wildlife commission meetings. Because here's what happens. Uh, people uh, like me have an event occur. Maybe more commonly, somebody gets a dog caught in a trap uh, and they uh, are very offended by this and they're mad the trap was just off a trail out in Spanish Springs or something. So that person goes to the Wildlife Commission meeting and wants to register a complaint, of course, not knowing how the whole thing works. So they show up at the break of dawn, waiting for the door to open, go into the Wildlife Com uh, Commission meeting and find out that they can't speak until the very end of the meeting because since their item was not um, agendized under the open meeting law, the only time they can speak to the commission unless coincidentally there was a trapping issue on the agenda, they have to wait till the very end of the meeting when the public comment occurs. And then during public comment, they can get up and speak to the commission, this person can, and usually with some fire and brimstone because of their dog getting caught in the trap. And the commissioners sit there like sphinxes and make no response to the person because they can't. Under the open meeting law, they cannot transact any business on an, on an item that was not published, you know, agendized ahead of the meeting. So then the person becomes very angry <laughs> and uh, usually goes away and never comes back because they're so mad at these guys that are sitting there and they talk about harvesting animals and all this stuff. And uh, it just is something more than most people can tolerate. Uh, but some of us stick it out or have. And if you do, you find ways to live with it and uh, you learn things uh, and you find out not everybody is, is a bad actor. It, it, there are many, many good people. The department is outstanding in my view. Uh, so uh, it depends on your perseverance and tolerance for unpleasantness and whether you're willing to sort of stay the course. It's a process. It's not a one-time fix. If anybody wants to, um, you know, have a serious discussion about it, send me an email. I think I have it on my screen. I've got it covered up and I'd be happy to talk more about what a person could do. Uh, but uh, it's not a very friendly place, the commission meetings for a naive uh, public member who's just coming in to learn about wildlife. Uh, generally, people don't come back. Well, that was a very good answer. Um, and uh, uh, I have a comment, sort of comment, slash, slash, you can make a discussion on this. Marshall commented saying uh, that he thinks we should discontinue the use of sportsmen. Um, and just kind of wondering what you think about that, since sport has a very good connotation, which is different from maybe what hunters and trappers are. Well, I, I appreciate Marshall's um, concern and I've had the same uh, thought uh, myself. Um, it, it does seem to be a misnomer, uh, particularly these days when um, the fair chase concept and, and sporting, uh, you know, tracking your game on foot and all that sort of stuff has gone by the wayside. 
everybody's got their ATVs and their pickups and their um, uh, laser sighted guns and uh, their GPS collars. There's not much sporting to it uh, anymore for many of them. And and uh, and I agree with him. Much like I would like to get rid of the term predator, uh, which is you know nobody wants to be called a predator, including a coyote or a mountain lion. I suspect so. I think terminology has a lot to do with things. Uh, I, I don't know, uh, I could, uh, one of my friends used to go to the commission meetings and instead of using the word sportsman when he was addressing the commission, he used the word wildlife killers and uh, did those in his written comments and in his spoken comments and uh, uh, created quite a bit of heat from the uh, commission chairman and others uh, they didn't particularly like that term as an alternative to sportsmen, and I suppose I can see why. But uh, Marshall has a great point. That there's a lot in words these days, as we well know from our political scene. Um, okay, so just one more question. Uh, Judy asks, what would it take to change the makeup of the Wildlife Commission? Yeah, that's an excellent question, and uh, that would take a change in the law. Uh, because currently the statute, uh, uh, th what I read you earlier about um, sportsman, rancher, farmer, that's all in Nevada statute. So the legislature would have to change the law. And there's quite a bit of interest around the country now. And in fact, there's a national coalition looking at trying to figure out how to change the composition of wildlife commissions. Because our problem in Nevada, which is an undemocratic system uh, in the worst way, is not unique to Nevada. It's common around the West and elsewhere. So the legislature in Nevada would have to change the law. That would be number one. Number two, the governor could seek a better quality appointments uh, if uh, perhaps uh, there's people who may fit the category but have a broader view of their responsibility than sometimes is the case. Uh, the third thing would be to get rid of the commission. That's my preference. There is no need for a commission. Uh, the department can receive all the federal money it's entitled to without a commission. The department could host its own uh, fact-finding uh, meetings and the computer could do most of what the Wildlife Commission spends two days every month doing, figuring out <laughs> quotas and whatnot. Uh, so my favorite uh, your recommendation is to get rid of the commission entirely. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know, well, first of all, I guess I want to thank Don uh, for the excellent presentation. And I just want to let everyone know that our next meeting will be on February 23rd, and it's going to feature Kirby Flanagan, and he's going to be presenting uh, a short presentation on bird photography. So we hope we can see you all there. Thank you all, and have a good night. Thanks.